Hi, and welcome to the Build Your Own Data Logger course, presented by Wild Labs and Freak Labs. This is part one of the second video in module one. In the last video, we looked at the flow or process we'll be using to build our custom data logger. In this video, we'll be going through the device design stack and looking at the physical hardware. When we say device, we mean a single application device that has one main purpose, such as a data logger, versus a laptop or a desktop PC that does many different things. So before we get started, let's have a look at what the design stack actually is. At the bottom, we have the physical hardware. Sitting on top of the physical hardware, we have the libraries and drivers. And the libraries and drivers provide the interface for our application to communicate and to control the physical hardware. The application sends the data to wherever we've told it to. That could be to an SD card, it could be wirelessly to the internet, or it could be via a cellular network to the internet. In this course, we're focusing on two things. We'll be building the physical hardware and we'll be writing the application that controls the hardware. So let's go through in more detail the physical hardware. The physical hardware is made up of three elements. There's a circuit board that controls everything, peripherals that attach to the circuit board and either send or receive data, and accessories that also attach to the circuit board but are less active. Peripherals interface with the real world and include things like temperature sensors, cameras, microphones, speakers and so on. They connect to the circuit board and send info as an input or receive info from the circuit board as an output, or they do both. The information sent or received is in analog or digital format. Accessories also attach to the circuit board, but they're more passive. They include things like antennas, battery cases, and solar panels. Now, let's look at the circuit board in more detail. There are two aspects we're going to look at. The first is how peripherals connect and interact with the circuit board, and we'll cover things like ports and interfaces, input and output pins. The second is what is actually on the circuit board and how it works, and that includes things like the central processing unit, MCU versus MPU, memory and power. So ports and interfaces. Ports and interfaces have different meanings depending on the context. When we're talking about hardware like this, we're talking about a port and interfaces somewhere where a peripheral or accessory physically connects to the circuit board. For example, on the WildLogger board, the USB dongle connects to a serial interface and downloads code to the board. On the I2C interface, you can add an LCD or an ultrasonic module. A module is a small, self-contained piece of hardware that plugs into your main board to add more functionality. Sometimes a module is also called a breakout board. An ultrasonic module measures the distance to an object. This could be used to measure water level, or measure when an animal comes within range. On sensor port 0 and sensor port 1, you can add a temperature humidity sensor, like we'll do in this course, or an infrared proximity sensor. Basically, once you're familiar with the hardware and how to program it, you can plug in different sensors and write your own application to customize the device. Sensors do need to be compatible with the type of interface on the board, and we'll go through what that means a bit later. They also need a library to communicate through, but that's why Arduino is so great. There's a good chance someone has already written the library for you. Let's go now to input and output or IO pins. So how are the interfaces and ports actually connecting a peripheral to the circuit board? Through pins. These pins are called input output pins or IO pins because they either send information from the peripheral to the circuit board as an input or receive information from the circuit board and send it to the peripheral as an output. A peripheral that interfaces to the system in a digital format connects to a digital pin. One that interfaces in an analog format connects to an analog pin. A digital pin can only be set to two values, low or zero volts, and high or 3.3 volts. It can also only read two values, low or high. It'll round off any voltage in between to one of those two values. An analog pin, on the other hand, can read any value between low, 0 volts, and high, 3.3 volts. If you're running out of digital pins, you can use an analog pin as a digital pin. This is what we do on the wild logger board, where the sensor ports connect to analog pins that can also be used as digital pins. 
If that's confusing, it'll become clearer once we get into writing the software. In our code, we use the pin number to access and control the hardware, and this is what we'll be using when we write our application. On the wild logger, we've allocated the pin numbers for you. Sensor port 0 uses analog pin 0, or A0. Sensor port 1 uses analog pin 1, or A1. Those pins can also be used to interface to digital devices, which we'll see with our temperature and humidity sensor. The PIR motion sensor port connects to digital pin 3, which has the special circuitry of being an interrupt. We'll get into that later on in the course. Let's go now to the circuit board where all the action happens. On the circuit board is the microcontroller, which includes a central processing unit or CPU, memory, power. The circuit board also contains other components and circuitry to manage power distribution, voltage, control the peripherals, manage storage, communications, and other functionalities such as a real-time clock or calendar. A good way to understand what's on a circuit is to look at its block diagram. A block diagram shows the principal parts or functions of the system and shows how they relate to each other. So this is the block diagram of the wild logger. And you can see we have the 1284p microcontroller, we have USB serial connector for the dongle, power supply, boost and voltage regulator, real-time clock, I squared C port, and a few other things as well. A key element of any system is the microcontroller. But what is a microcontroller? And how is it different to a microprocessor? And where does the central processing unit fit in? Let's dive into it. A microcontroller is a chip that contains a CPU, memory, and peripherals like I2C, analog to digital converters, and serial ports, whereas a microprocessor only contains a central processing unit. Why are they different and why does it matter? For microcontrollers, they're used for simpler applications and devices such as data logging, like the one we're making. It has a defined specific input output interactions. A microcontroller executes code quicker and is quicker to start up. It's lower cost, and most importantly for us, it has a lower power consumption. A microprocessor, on the hand, is used more in computers such as laptops and desktops. It can handle multiple complex applications where there's less structure between the I.O. interactions. For example, your laptop can handle you coding in R whilst listening to music and chatting on Slack. It has external memory and power. It usually costs more, and it has a higher power consumption. So let's move on now to the central processing unit. The central processing unit is really the brains of the system and it sits within the microcontroller. At its core, what the central processing unit does is it takes input from, for example, a sensor. It stores that input as data in the memory, then requests instructions from the memory on how to process the data. It then processes the data and saves the results in memory. Once it's finished the processing and executing all the commands, it sends the data as an output as per the instructions it was given. That's it for this video. If you have questions, post them to the forum or bring them along to the fortnightly office hours. In the next video, we'll look at two crucial elements, memory and power.